Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's Friday uh, PMI Friday webinar. It's wonderful to have you all with us. Um, my name is Rich Seddon, and I'll be facilitating the session this afternoon. I'm running the Q&A desk. Please do keep me busy. You'll find the Q&A controls in the Zoom uh, control panel. Throughout the webinar, uh, we'll be taking questions, and I'll put them to Marie Claire as, uh, as we proceed. Today's webinar is being broadcast live on Facebook, as well as recorded. Um, we'll send you a link to the recordings, but you can also find them on the webinar uh, page, the URL of which is on screen at the moment, pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars. Finally for me, before we get underway, um, I'd just like to uh, remind you that at the end of the session, we'll send you um, a voice of the customer survey. Now, I linked very much to understanding customer and stakeholder requirements. This is how we do it. So I'd really appreciate it if you could uh, take the time, just a few minutes to uh, fill in that survey. Um, there's two sections to that. The first section is around your experience today. The second uh, is for your suggestions for future topics for the PMI Friday webinar series. Um, the August schedule, as I say, has been published this morning and that was based entirely on feedback that we had um, from uh, people that attended during July and June. Um, so please let us know um, is there anything you'd like us to cover, suggest it there. Now, I would, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Marie Claire, who will be presenting today's webinar. Marie Claire there testing my nerves of steel. Uh, it looked like she wasn't present and I thought I was going to have to do my top hat and cane routine all round. Uh, okay, thanks very much, MC. Over to you. Hello, good afternoon everybody. Well, good afternoon from the UK uh, and a warm welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me for this webinar on customer and stakeholder requirements and I trust things are well for you um, in whatever part of the world you're joining me from. So during this session I aim to share with you some of the insights and learning from my work highlighting importance of knowing who our customers are, deeply understanding their requirements and the sorts of things that can happen if we don't get it right. Today's situation is indeed extraordinary because the changes we are facing are fundamentally different to anything that we knew before. Everyone is in the process of working out what life means for them now and moving forwards without much of a clear picture right now. The existence of many businesses are in question they're asking themselves or should be asking themselves the question, how will they be relevant in the new normal? At the same time, we actually have a lot of businesses that are thriving. So we're going to explore a little bit more about why this is and how our customers and stakeholders are influencing our organisations. So why do organisations exist? Well, Peter Drucker, a world-renowned thinker on leadership and management, taught for over 70 years the importance of getting on the same side of the desk as your customer. In these unprecedented times of change, there is a need for us to get back to the basics of business if our organisations are going to prosper. This may sound deceptively simple, but let me ask you this question. What's the purpose of your business? Our experience of working with senior leaders of organisations of all different shapes and sizes all over the world informs us that this is one of the most difficult questions for senior leaders to answer. Today, I would argue that it's the fundamental question that needs to be clearly answered for our businesses to prosper in the new normal. So why do we need to know who our customers and stakeholders are? The ISO standard determines customers as clients, end users, retailers, beneficiaries, purchasers, consumers, depending on the type of industry that you're working in. But a customer is defined as somebody who receives output from a process. So we may well have internal customers as well as external. So two questions we have. Do you have customers that have the same requirements? And do they place the same importance on those requirements as they did, say, six months ago? 
Rich, we've got a question. Uh, yes, indeed. So this uh, got first out of the blocks. Uh, Dave has just asked a question uh, very quickly on the slide you're uh, currently showing. Um, the question is, MC, uh, in your experience, how often uh, do you see companies expressing and defining their customers uh, in the ways that that uh, diagram shows on screen at the moment? Despite quite a lot of information that's certainly supplied by the ISO about how organizations should be working with their customers, it's often quite poorly done. There's a number of reasons for that, time, cost, um, and also the fact that there are another few voices that also play a part in this as well. And I'm going to come on to that next. Okay, Dave, uh, do let us know if you've got any further follow-up to that. Our customers are only one part of the story. It's not as simple as just considering what your customers want. We have numerous other interested parties and stakeholders. So it's about how do we know what they want from us and how do we know about how they feel about what we do? All too often, the voice of the customer is lost. The voice of the regulator or the business becomes the loudest voice. I've previously worked in a bank who were trying to satisfy the regulator's requirements of lending more money to small businesses, but at the same time lending responsibly. The challenge that they were finding was how to provide customer satisfaction whilst trying to work within the constraints that were provided by the regulator. That was actually quite a challenging setup. So what we find is if we keep the requirements of our end customers at the heart of everything we do, so at the heart of our organization's goals and targets, and treat the requirements of the business and the regulator and other interested parties as being constraints or the must have in pursuit of that customer satisfaction, we can keep our focus on the voice of the customer. Understanding our customers' needs better than they know themselves allows us to be able to anticipate their requirements, exceed their expectations, and ultimately lead to competitive advantage. On a daily basis, we're hearing about businesses that are cutting jobs or going into administration. The global economy is competing in a highly competitive market right now. Those that are thriving have one thing in common. Everything they do is aligned to delivering unrivaled customer satisfaction. Sounds simple, but to get there takes a very different approach to the one that leads to cost cutting. So once we know who our customers are, we need to understand their requirements. And to do this, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey that I've experienced over the last few months. And I'm sure most of you will be able, if not all of you, will be able to relate to this, no matter where you, where you are in the world. So in a time before COVID-19, I could shop anywhere, anytime. Shelves were fully stacked. I'd just take my basket or trolley, do my shopping, not really think about it. Queue up, pay, leave, go home, put things away. If I was shopping online, I'd have a choice of delivery slots whenever I wanted. COVID-19 hits and we're a few weeks into lockdown. Now we're now starting to experience long queues, empty shelves, restricted shopping time, shorter opening hours. I can't get a delivery slot even if I'm sat there waiting for the slots to be released at midnight. What I found is that requirements that I had that I didn't really think much of, or think much about, should I say, they were important, but I didn't think much about them, have now become wanted. I want to be able to go shopping. I want to be able to get what I want. Things that previously were just expectations. As lockdown progressed, what we're finding through my experience was that a lot of our wants have now become delighters. 
people who were shopping on uh, who shopped online are absolutely delighted that they could get a delivery slot it might not have been the most convenient but they got a slot things like getting fresh fruit and vegetables you know for for me that was a couple of weeks into lockdown before i could get as i expected and i'm finding and found that I was actually spending more on things that I would consider basics. So, you know, things like toilet rolls. One point was the most expensive item in my shopping basket. But I was delighted because for weeks there hadn't been any on the shelves. What I was also finding and speaking to friends and colleagues as well, that becoming more conscious about new requirements about my shopping. So when was I going to go? Where was I going to go? What did I need to get? How did I make sure that I was going to be as safe as possible whilst I was going shopping? Not something that I'd ever, reason, I'd ever previously considered. As we're now entering the new normal, you know, things are starting to become a bit more available. So things like delivery slots. But then I'm getting this trade off between, well, you can have a delivery slot and you can have a delivery, but my items are arriving and they're damaged, or I've got replacement items for the ones that I wanted that aren't available. So I'm now starting to think about what, well, okay, so how does this work for me? For the first time, I'm considering the impact on my health. I'm having to have additional requirements like wearing a mask, gloves, wiping the trolley down, being able to put my um, items away, having first having to clean them before I can put them away. And today in England, it's become law that you must wear a, ma a face covering in shops, else they have the right to prevent you from coming in. So again, another requirement that I have to consider as a customer. So one of the questions I've been asking myself recently is to what degree are supermarkets, in this example, and their suppliers, considering the extra requirements that have now been put on their customers? What can they do to make my experience as one of their customers better? What I've described as I've talked you through that journey of my change in requirements is a model that Dr. Kano defined in the late 1970s, this notion of quality being along two dimensions, the degree to which a product or service performs and the degree to which the user is satisfied. Looking at requirements in this way creates an ability to define quality in a much more sophisticated and holistic way. In most situations that I'd previously experienced, requirements tended to move from left to right. So if I'd experienced something as a delight factor, it very quickly became something that I wanted and then something that I expected. The recent crisis has actually skewed this and for what was expected for a lot of people became wanted, became delighters and then has moved back again. Why is it important for us to understand this, that our customer requirements fit into different buckets? Well, I'd say there's no point in having a car that can do naught to 60 in 3.7 seconds with a top speed of 191 miles per hour if it spends most of its time on the back of a breakdown truck. My expectation is that if I'm having a car, that actually it's going to have those basic requirements that it's reliable, I can get from A to B. So here, with the situation, we're missing the expected and trying to delight. You won't delight your customers if you fail to meet their expected requirements. It is the customer who defines what their requirements are and what importance they place on them. To assume what the customer wants can lead to significant customer dissatisfaction. 
A few years ago, in an effort to save weight and therefore reduce emission levels, many vehicle manufacturers moved away from having a spare wheel in the car. Unfortunately, for most customers, the first time they knew this had happened was when they were sat on the side of the road with a puncture. Those vehicle manufacturers failed to check with the customers what their expectations were. And in a lot of cases, this led to dissatisfaction. What we need to keep in mind is that one customer's delight may be another person's expected. So we need a method to, by which to handle customers with different requirements. And this is something we would do through market segmentation, for example. Our customers value lots of different things. And I, for one, will often buy items that may be a little bit more expensive, but I might get free advice with them. So for example, I will use my local butcher. He's very good at telling me how to cook in the best way to cook and serve the meat that I'm buying. For me, that advice is, is uh, invaluable, especially when I'm cooking for my parents. So what do our customers experience? Above all else, customers value high levels of consistency. Our customers relate consistency with quality. Let me give you an example. Got availability of access to a bank's online banking facilities. Something that you know, we expect to be able to do in today's, with today's technology, to be able to do our online banking at any time. For the last six months, the performance has been running on average 96%. Question is, is that acceptable? It's the customer who decides if it's acceptable or not. And the challenge we have here is that customers experience the variation, not the average. Some customers won't have experienced any dissatisfaction as they weren't affected, but others would have been affected by the service not being available when they expected it to be and therefore have, uh, have experienced dissatisfaction. So we need to bear in mind that our customers experience the variation and not the average. But the customer is always right. I would suggest that this depends on a number of factors. Depends on what they expected what they've experienced before and what they know. So a lot of, as a customer, a lot of the things we consider in terms of making choices come down to what we have experienced in the past or information that we've had from other sources, so other people, external communications. So there's this idea between what we expect and what, we, and what we perceive that we got. Blaming our customers for their mistakes is not an option. If they got it wrong, we need to ask ourselves, what was it that we didn't understand about their requirements or our ability to translate those needs into our products and services? It's our job to get behind what our customers say to us and really understand their thoughts, emotions, actions, and needs. That leads again to competitive advantage. A few years ago, I had a new kitchen fitted and I went to several suppliers. The supplier that I went with was the supplier who effectively got the same side as the desk as me to understand what it was that I really needed from my kitchen. If I had been given what I'd asked for, I would be a very dissatisfied customer right now. But because of the way in which they approached it, I got more than I expected and actually was delighted in a number of situations. 
Rich, got another question. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, it actually refers to your previous slide, uh, MC. It's a question from Julie. Um, sorry, Julie, uh, Elaine, um, <laughs> take that back. Um, the, uh, I alarmed Julie there by suggesting she'd ask the question. <laughs> um, so uh, Elaine says, uh, my, my business has a 98% service level target. Um, most people in the business think that's good and acceptable. I'm mm. becoming to think not, so, I'm beginning to think I'm not so sure. Do you see targets like this in other businesses? And uh, would you have any observations on that? It is very common to see performance um, communicated as a percentage. Um, the challenge is, is doing that translation into, well, what does that actually mean? So the illustration here was like 96%. But if we've got a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 days a year service, then I've done the maths on this. <laughs> so I'm not getting this one. Um, that's seven, nearly seven and a half days when the service isn't as available. So one of, one of the next steps might be is to take that 98% and translate it into, well, what does that mean in real terms for your customer? Mm -hmm. And to be able to explore it that way and help others to understand, well, when is good, good enough? Okay, great. And, um, uh, and Elaine, the um, slides MC is about to go on to will help with some of the methods but, uh, that you can use for that, but please do uh, give me a shout if you've got any more questions. Thank you. Pop through that. Communicating with your customers is important. I'd say it's, it's again, in terms of thinking about the requirement, who are they, their requirements, and then being able to communicate with them. Because I need you to tell me what you're going to do. I need you to do what you say you're going to do. Keep me informed of progress and to the best of the ability, and this comes down to process and the strength of the processes, avoid any changes. Don't make assumptions that changes are okay with me and deliver what you promise. I'm very conscious in the work that I do of my experience as a customer and how many organizations are still using the, the COVID situation for why they are having challenges with their operations. That is absolutely understandable. But what I have noticed is the organizations who are finding different ways around that and providing customer service, exceptional customer service, despite the challenging environment in which we're operating. So all of this leads us to being able to create an advantage across our entire customer and stakeholder range. New needs are being created, existing ones are being reprioritized or amended. We're facing a dynamic and lasting situation. So how ready are our organizations and agile to be, to respond to our customers? So three questions, how well are we listening? How well are you understanding? And how well are you delivering? The way I would suggest and the most effective way of doing this is by putting yourself in your customer's shoes. Drucker stated the importance of getting on the same side of the desk as your customer. So a question to you, how often do you, your colleagues in your organization, walk in your customer's shoes? How often do we experience our products and services as our customers would, as they would journey through their, their experience of us as an organization? Have we identified all of the interactions that we have with a customer, these touch points, right from before a customer even becomes a customer, when they're Googling suppliers and they come across us, what are the first things they see right the way through to the end of their journey when you're looking at disposal of a product or an after service um, that supports that? 
and focusing on what the customer is experiencing, not what we do, but how they feel, think, feel and think about what it is that they are experiencing as a result of what we do. These are ideas called moments of truth. To be able to do this effectively, it takes data. The world around us is changing. But how do we know it's changing? What data are you looking at? How are you looking at it? And how are you analyzing it in a way that helps you to understand if things have really changed? We have theories and assumptions that because of what has happened, things have changed, but we need data to help us understand in what ways they have changed because we can only react appropriately if we have the right data in, analyzed in the right way to help us to understand that. So our goal is for stable, predictable and capable process performance with a capacity to deliver our customers' requirements. We need the ability to adapt our processes to a new normal whilst managing our customers' expectations, therefore being able to deliver consistent performance, con consistent exposure for our customers. We can only do this if we are looking at data in the right way, so using process behavior charts. So is it a simple question of just surviving or prospering? We want our businesses to thrive going forwards. So we all need time to make the transition to a new situation. For many of us as customers, we have already moved through the initial phases and are sort of letting go and trying out new ways. In the early stages, many of us will have experienced a level of shock and maybe denial that things would be different. And I still hear it today. People go, oh, it'll go back to how it used to be. Maybe it will, but actually we need to be prepared that our processes need to be adaptable to our, dif our different customers and also their different requirements and priorities of those requirements. We are looking for businesses as customers who understand our requirements and the prioritization of those requirements and how they may have changed. We're looking for organizations who can deliver our requirements in spite of the challenging environment. So how do organizations remain viable and turn the situation to their advantage? Listen to the voice of the customer. Thank you, Rich. Do we have any further questions? Yes, indeed. Um, so there's actually a, a, few, <laughs> a few I was saving up here. Um, uh, so we've got one on um, the listening processes and mapping the customer journey. Um, what would be your top tips, uh, Marie-Claire, on mapping the customer journey? In fact, we've got two questions uh, that have covered the same subject. I've merged those together there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there, there are lots of ways that uh, we can understand the voice of our customer and you'll come across things like surveys, um, secret shoppers, those sorts of situations. Uh, but for me, the most effective one is actually getting alongside your customer, walking in their shoes, being able to experience what they experience. And for most of us and most of our organizations, that is possible to do. So right, you know, experiencing what the sales process feels like, you know, going into um, so one, of our, one of the shops or one of the dealerships or um, sitting, sitting in, a, in, or sitting in on calls um, with, with your customers, feeling what they feel, 
asking them the questions about, so how was the experience for you real time? So that again, you can test your own theories about what you're experiencing. And the, the additional comment I'd add to that MC actually is looking for disproving evidence as well. Um, it's quite common, I'm sure you'll agree, that uh, organisations will develop a perception of how their customers, uh, of the voice of the customer that becomes embedded. Um, and the, the skill and ability of being prepared to disprove those theories um, and challenge those theories that may be long held and cherished um, is, is, a, uh, is an even more vital skill than normal uh, for success. Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I've actually got one other, which I'll, uh, I'll uh, ask about later on. Um, but yeah, please do keep your questions coming. Thank you. So my summary reflections then. Keeping customers centric to all that we do. Ensure we're listening to our customers and reassure them that they're actually being heard. So that comes back to the point we were just made there. Provide the confidence to enable our customers and stakeholders to overcome their own limiting beliefs about what can be done. We've seen a lot of that over the last few months about, uh, say, oh, no, we won't be able to do it that way because our customers won't accept that. Helping people to overcome that and finding different ways of providing services. Rethinking what it is our customers and stakeholders need or how existing ones are being reprioritized or amended. Again, not making the assumptions, but checking in with our customers. We need to be able to deliver them through robust, capable and adaptable processes. We need to invest in processes and the methods by which they can be delivered. These processes are a core asset to your organization and on which you, must, you need to be able to depend so that you can deliver customer satisfaction. Be prepared that adapting current processes or ways of working may not be sufficient to satisfy the changes in customers and all their requirements we may actually need to look at a complete redesign or complete blank piece of paper to design new processes to deliver those requirements. So we talk a lot about continuous improvement of our processes, but this current situation does highlight the fact that actually some of our processes may not be fit for the purpose that they need in terms of delivering our new customers' requirements. So therefore, we do need to look at a method by which we would design new processes for that. Okay, fantastic. Uh, MC, we've got another question here. Um, this is uh, specifically around approaches to uh, assessing customer satisfaction. Um, it's, it, the question's oriented around preferences, but um, I think the, the essence of it is, um, comparing a critical incident investigation approach to uh, customer service uh, satisfaction or focus groups, um, would you have a preference between the two of those um, and, uh, and any comments you'd like to make on that subject? I think both are very valuable methods. Uh, they have slightly different purposes. Mm -hmm. The first feels more like um, an approach that would be used after something has happened to understand deeply what the issues were, what that meant for the customer, what it resulted for the customer, and therefore being able to learn from it in that respect. The second method, that's, that feels more like a proactive approach to being able to get different customers' thoughts um, together to understand how you might um, adapt some theories that you have about what you're proposing to put, for example, to put to market. Mm -hmm. I say both are very valuable. They just have different contexts, I would suggest. Okay, fantastic. And um, we've got a great question here, um, which, which I, I may help you out with, if you forgive me. Um, the question is, how does PMI listen to the voice of its own customers and understand its customer and stakeholder requirements? 
Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> I can take some of that. And then if you'd like to. Yeah, sure. In there. Um, so in the work that, that, that we do as um, consultants, when we're client facing, we're constantly checking in with our customers um, as to how things are going. So for, an ex for example, if you were to join us on one of our training courses on a daily basis, we do something called a plus Delta where we, we get feedback um, say so what are the things that have gone well what did you enjoy what do you want to do more of the deltas so where are there things that we could improve on and how might we improve on those so we do that on a daily basis with our training but also with our client uh, consulting interventions as well um, and checking in with all of the stakeholders uh, with our uh, with our with our approach and it's it's a lot of that customer feedback comes from having the conversation and then being able to distill from those conversations, okay, so what was that, what was important that was coming from that? Hmm. And the, the plus delta um, in the moment reviews, which I'm sure I can see many of, you, many of the names on the attendees today will have experienced, is also, um, we, we do a 360 version of that, where the individual delivering the service also reflects on their, uh, on their service, and we call that an ABCD um, report, activities, benefits, concerns, do next. So those are the in the moment uh, aspects. Uh, on top of that, we do formally survey. So we have, uh, we have an, an automated platform um, to, um, to collect voice of the customer in a typical satisfaction type survey. We do two things with that, which I think is worth mentioning. Uh, one is we exception monitor. So we have automated workflows on exceptions. That entire system is geared around the net promoter score, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, NPS. So we look for, we have automated escalations for any, any uh, responses that are anything other than a promoter. Um, and then the second and actually much richer approach is the regular human review of the feedback, um, which we do uh, on a 10 day cycle um, to actually read through comments. And it's often the free text comments that provide you uh, the most. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of good discipline, um, we uh, do end of assignment uh, exit uh, satisfaction reviews as well with clients. So when we reach the end of a, uh, an assignment, we do a, a 360 review with them as well. Which, so you, you're building together a picture from several dimensions as uh, MC described earlier on to check this issue of perception um, and, challenge, and try and challenge that perception um, um, uh, as much as possible. Um, so I've got two others uh, here, MC, as well. Okay. Um, the one's about frequency. Um, how the question is, and almost answers itself to a degree, but I think uh, we're interested in your perception. Um, how often should we get the voice of the customer? Um, would it vary based upon the products uh, or products or services, and based on the different customer groups? Yeah, <laughs> that that that's a that's that's a great question with a quite a challenging answer um we are we're looking at one dimension here really today in terms of our customer and stakeholder requirements uh, i think it was on uh, warren's uh, webinar he did a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at the system in the context of the external environment all too often it's something that happens in the external environment that causes our customers to change their requirements so um, social media has a great part to play in how our customers perceive the world around them and therefore what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Um, so we do have to have in our organizations robust processes that are capturing that voice of the external environment and allowing that translation back into our processes internally. How often you should do that? That's going to depend on, I suppose, the maturity of your organization, the sector that you're working in, the environment in which you're operating in terms of the types of changes that are happening right now. We are going to, we're almost playing a little bit of catch up with our customers. And actually, if we spoke to our, a lot of our customers, they don't really know what their requirements are. So how do we develop our mechanisms by which we can understand them before they understand themselves, that gives us a competitive advantage. And the, <clears throat> the other thing I'd add to that, uh, Mary Claire, is uh, certainly in the current context where lots of processes are being redesigned, 
um, it's in many circumstances advisable to increase the frequency um, uh, in current uh, situations and in general situations of process redesign. Um, that's to enable you to uh, adjust course rapidly and gain feedback rapidly. Um, so uh, we certainly do that ourselves and we'd advise clients to do it. In a situation of a process redesign where it's an unproved new process, um, it's perfectly reasonable and in fact advisable to increase the frequency um, and potentially the detail in which you uh, seek that uh, to hear that customer voice in the format you do it in. And part of our design process is there are several touch points with the customers, the end customers of the product or service that you're designing for before you even get to a point where you have a prototype for them, for them to test. So yeah, you are touching in with them on a number of occasions. Okay, and uh, we've got time for one last question and uh, we've saved the best to last. This is probably one of the most challenging questions, MC. Um, <laughs> so thanks, <Yeah>. Ethel. Thanks, <laughs> Ethel, for asking it. Um, uh, uh, what, what do you do if your organization is not ready to redesign its processes and methods in meeting customer requirements? So they're not ready. So, so I suppose for me, the question comes back to a, probably a little bit more um, internal analysis as to what's, what's causing them to feel that way at the moment. What's, what's blocking them from seeing it as a need? Mm -hmm. um, so is it that it's just in a blind spot? Um, is it because the KPIs look good um, and we're not seeing what's coming um, in the future. Um, so I think it is, it's about understanding, probably looking internally, first of all, as to what is happening within the organization to understand where that, that those, those statements are coming from. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my recommendation for your activity in the meantime is to build the case. And um, Mary Claire referred to uh, earlier on about uh, the, the, the data, the importance of data. Um, in the absence of readiness to change, building the case to change is the only course of action. Um, so being very clear and collecting the data and changing the customer voice in order to build the case for change. Um, organizational readiness is one thing, but if you haven't got a clear business case in order to, to make for that change, um, and I'm not saying you haven't, Ethel, by the way, I don't, I'm not sure of the circumstances, but in, in that position, that's what, uh, that's what I would certainly be advising building that business case, collecting the data to really clearly demonstrate the sources of pain and the pain that your processes are causing for your customers. If expressed like that, it can be very powerful. And I've seen minds changed amongst board, board teams very quickly when they can see a, perfect, a process that is perfectly designed to cause their customer inconvenience and pain. Mm -hmm. And when it's expressed like that with the correct and robust data sets, it becomes a much easier argument to have and actually uh, a clearer decision, uh, an easier decision to make where there is resistance to it. Yeah. One of the other things that could support that and becomes part of the business case as well is looking at what your direct competitors are doing or potential new entrants to the market. Um, it, a lot of organizations, you know, they are actively putting those messages out there. So if you can compare, uh, provide uh, part of that case, what is it your direct competitors are doing, then you know, this then comes back down to the business strategy and you know, how, you know, how, that, how, you, how your organization is going to compete in that market going forwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And we just had another one sneak over the line here for our final question. Um, the, um, are, are, am I correct in assuming that this also applies to in, internal organizational customers as well as external? Yes, indeed. Um, so um, thinking back, some of you will have hopefully have joined uh, uh, Desi's webinar last week where he looked at uh, robustness of supply chains. There is a series of customer supplier links right the way through the value chain, which also then comes into your own internal organizations. And as much as this applies to your external customer, it implies to, uh, applies to your internal customers as well. Because if, you, if it's not flowing through your value chain, you cannot deliver customer satisfaction to your end customer. Fantastic. Thank you very much, MC. Um, so um, 
thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, the full schedule for August, as I mentioned, has been published this morning. Um, please do take a look and book on to the sessions. Uh, I'm actually running a session next week, so I'm not uh, hosting the Q&A for a change. I'm running a session on digital process transformation, uh, my hints and tips and insights uh, for that next week, which is uh, Friday the 31st. Um, please do register, join me for that. Uh, in the meantime, um, wishing you all a very safe and happy uh, relaxing weekends. And please, once again, please do fill in the customer uh, voice, the customer survey. Um, we're hoping for record uh, response rates from this one in particular, given the subject. Thank you very much for joining us. Have great weekends. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care.